Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Control Your Lighting with Hall of Fame webinar. My name is Tim Hu from Buffalo Smith Electric, and I'll be your host today. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping items before I hand it off to our presenter. Uh, first off, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be shared after the event. Secondly, uh, there is a short six question survey following the event that can be taken immediately, or it can be accessed via the follow-up email, which you will receive at the conclusion. Also, uh, we encourage you to submit any relevant questions during the webinar via the Q&A function located on the bottom of the menu. We'll be sending out digital $5 Starbucks gift cards for those who participate. And finally, a quick thank you to those who participated in our attend and bring a friend promotion. Uh, we'll be sending you and your registered friend a digital $20 Grubhub gift card in appreciation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kyle Gottlobson from Acuity Brands. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to turn on my, uh, my video just real quick, just to introduce myself. I'm Kyle Gottlobson. I'm the Director of Total Solutions for uh, Acuity Brands uh, for a huge chunk of the United States. And uh, we're here to talk, today to talk about uh, our uh, industrial lighting control offering. Um, I'm going to turn my video off here. I just want to wave at everybody Oop, this side and uh, say hi. I'm going to turn off my video and jump into the presentation and share my screen here uh, as we go. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. So put in there real quick. And I got to reshare here. All right, Tim, if you would just confirm for me that you can actually see. Oh, wait, it did not work. Hold on. Let's do that again. You can see. Yeah, we oh, can see. It, it went. Yeah. Okay. Just took a lag. Okay. <laughs> so we're here to talk about uh, Light Air by Acuity Brands, or really just Acuity Brands Hall of Fame as part of that. Um, Hall of Fame is our industrial uh, focused lighting arm. And so you'll see references to either Acuity Brands or Hall of Fame throughout this presentation. Uh, just know that that's basically the same company. Uh, I work for Acuity Brands technically, but uh, when we go into the industrial space, most of the fixtures that we lead with are Hall of Fame branded fixtures. That, and uh, just a little disclosure, Denise doesn't know this, but I'm actually a former Hall of Famer uh, from back in the day myself. So I, I did actually work for Hall of Fame for a short period of time. Nice. Yeah. So um, what we're going to talk about today, and the first thing I want to talk about that is it's kind of important, is why embed control in a lighting fixture? And this is particularly important in the industrial space. Um, when you're dealing with industrial lighting, you're dealing, especially LED lighting, um, you're dealing with a long-term investment. You're dealing with a LED fixture that you're hopefully going to hang in the heights of some industrial space, and you're not going to have to touch that fixture for, you know, eight, ten years if you uh, if the value proposition of an LED fixture uh, these days is is held true. All right, and that's a tremendous investment in lighting um, and making sure that 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 value proposition actually delivers, right? So uh, you really want to make sure that when you're putting a control or you're pairing a control with a fixture, particularly in an industrial environment, that you uh, do so in a very controlled manner. Most industrial fixtures are either IP65 or IP66 rated. So you need to maintain that uh, ingress protection rating. Um, most of them have high heat standards. Some of them go up to 75 degrees C. And you have to make sure that whatever control that you put in with that fixture does not limit the fixture's uh, environmental uh, considerations. Or if it does, it, it doesn't limit it enough that it affects your operation. Um, and the, the other thing is, is there are some risk involved with adding a third party control to a, to a fixture, right? Yeah, you can do it. Um, and you hope that the, whoever does it in the field does it well. Uh, but a lot of times when you add a third party control to a fixture, uh, the damage that is done may not be apparent for a year or two. Uh, and now all of a sudden, a year later or two years later, you're finding you have an inordinate amount of fixture failures and it's because water got into a fixture or because something overheated uh, or because something shorted, right? So it, it's very important that the people putting the controls in the fixtures understand the fixture itself and can provide a single warranty and a single point of service for everything in that fixture. Um, so that's kind of the building block for what I'm about to talk to talk about next is that, you know, putting control in that fixture, you know, why would you do that, right? And how is the best way to do that? 
Um, by and large, lighting is a pretty simple, uh, it is a pretty simple uh, machine, particularly LED lighting. Uh, they've gotten, you know, there's no moving parts. There's just a, actually two or three components in an industrial fixture. And so we wanna keep it simple. And because simple is where the reliability comes from. You start putting too many complex things together and you start having failures that nobody understands. All right, so the system that we use out in, out in space out there is a system called Enlight Air. We also have another older system that uh, we've also leveraged, which is X-Point Wireless. You may hear or see some of that in, uh, in the marketplace today, but either way, they all fall under our Enlight brand. Uh, our Enlight brand has been deployed to tens of thousands of customers. We have well over 2 billion square feet. Um, a huge chunk of that is industrial. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. And uh, we can tell you with, that there are no real new ideas in lighting control, particularly for the, uh, the um, industrial space. I just spent the better part of two weeks doing an industrial competitive review for controls. And I can tell you that a lot of ideas that people think are new uh, have been around in the industry for, you know, at least in the lighting industry for 10 years or more. And so uh, there really are no really new ideas, despite what people may think out there. Um, you know, even IoT is something that, that uh, isn't necessarily new. So what are we talking about with controls? We're talking about building a robust brain, right? This is, this is the very simple brain that operates the fixture and does it 100, you know, 365 days a year, all the time without fail. Um, you know, the idea behind a lighting company is that we build brains that don't fail, right? We build systems, we build smarts into the systems that, that don't fail, or if they do fail, they fail in intelligent manners, right? They fail on versus failing off. Um, they, they, fail to, they will fail to a local control versus a centralized control. So that's important. Uh, important aspect as you think of a lighting control system is that it doesn't necessarily all have to be controlled from on high. Uh, most of what happens with a lighting control system can happen down at the fixture level or even at the group level. Hey, Jeff. I'm oh, sorry, Kyle. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a quick question in the, in the okay. chat. Um, someone wants to know how long are the warranties on the lights, on your lights? Standard warranty is five years. It's five years, including uh, lighting and control, usually. Um, extended warranties are available depending on the environmental conditions of the site, right? So, um, and Denise, you can weigh in on that too, how you guys handle extended warranties. Um, I think the longest I've seen is a 10 year warranty. Uh, I don't have, and that was not in an industrial facility, but I, I don't rule out the fact. Denise, have we ever done a 10 year in an industrial? Yes, we have. Um, we just have to gather some information first and then bring it back to the company. And then, uh, you know, we can uh, definitely provide a 10 year warranty. Typically, the concerns for us as a manufacturer are that does the, are the environmental considerations met for the fixture. We want to make sure that the fixture is being operated in an environment that it was intended for. And then from a control standpoint, we usually um, require some sort of startup or verification that the controls were uh, that we were commissioned or started up correctly. Uh, usually that's kind of a proviso for any kind of warranty past five years, but the standard warranty is five years. And when you're designing around a, a LED system that you know, may be up there 15, 20 years from now, um, you, know, you don't know how long these systems are gonna live past their, uh, their standard design life. Um, so it does make sense to think about that in the long haul. It's a great question. All right, so let's talk about the system. Uh, the platform in general. So I'm going to show you the top down part of this platform first is that Enlight is typically uh, the center part of Enlight is a wired system that is used in drop ceiling environments, uh, front office, headquarters, that sort of things. That's where Enlight actually started 20 years ago um, and has evolved into all kinds of different spaces. We recognize very early on that a lot of spaces like the outdoor space and the Industrial space uh, did not lend themselves to wires, control wires that is. And so we rolled out um, and have done wireless control in the manufacturing and outdoor environments for about eight years now. Um, 
The, we then, uh, about six years ago, we realized that on the upper end of our projects, that there was a lot of room for tying in lighting control with other systems, either HVAC or PLC based systems. Um, there was also the ability to add metering uh, into our system, which was something that had been requested by many of our customers. And now, uh, and by the way, many of these ideas are not new. Like I said, these ideas have been in play for 15 to 20 years. It's just the acceptance in the marketplace has finally started to catch up with what the capabilities of the systems were, right? And then finally, uh, in the last several years, um, we've started to see more uh, people looking for advanced graphics and for advanced functionality, i.e. the industrial IoT, where we want to start using our uh, fixtures for more than lighting control. We want to use our fixtures as control points for an asset management system, some sort of internal navigation, some inventory management, um, other IoT use cases that people have been talking about for quite a long time are also possible uh, when you have a smart wireless system that's above. But we don't like to outkick our coverage. Um, we like to kind of stick to the things that work and that are tried and true. So let's talk about Enlight Air and how it works just down at the fixture level. Enlight Air is a, it is a dual radio system. And it's dual radio uh, because uh, we wanted to use a radio for control that had long range and could be uh, much more securable. So that's why we settled on the 900 megahertz radio band. The 900 megahertz band um, has been somewhat abandoned uh, I don't know if many of you how old most of the people are in here, but they used to, that used to be the cordless phone haven back in 20 years ago. And then everything moved to 2.4 gig and five gigahertz and beyond. And so the 900 megahertz uh, ISF spectrum is, is pretty wide open these days. And with a lower frequency, we're able to get uh, to more range, better penetration of metal and other structures. Uh, and so we were able to leverage that 900 megahertz frequency and then update it to you know, 2020 standards for digital security and, and the rest. And then the Bluetooth radio, the Bluetooth radio is actually used, um, so we use the 900 megahertz radio in between fixtures, but that Bluetooth radio is used for configuration information sharing. Why? Because every smart device out there has a Bluetooth radio in it. And obviously that's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I can grab almost any iPhone and I could commission our system with it, any modern iPhone, I should say, you know, something built in the last five years. Um, and then, but the problem is, is that also presents a security opening that we need to address. And I'll address that in the presentation later when we get to it. So, um, so anyway, keep moving forward. So moving forward, actually I'll address it right now. I forgot it was in the slide earlier here, but uh, we have five tier security built into a wireless system. Obviously, when you have a system that just about anybody can talk to with their phone, it has to be very secure. So let's talk about the different levels. Um, first of all, we offer data encryption. So obviously, all of the communication between your iPhone and the, uh, the, the main device in the network and the network between each other is all encrypted. Um, it's not sniffable in any way, shape, or form. We have firmware protection, meaning that all the firmware that gets uploaded is checksummed and the device will not run firmware that's injected from a third party because the checksums are not gonna match. We have tamper resistant hardware. So all of the hardware in every single device, you know, nothing's removable, there are no memory cards. There's no other way to take, a, take one of our fixtures down, pull a card out and try to repurpose it into uh, a sniffing or a hacking machine, which happens with some other systems. Authenticated user access. This is probably the most important one. Um, all authentication for the system happens through the cloud. So even though you can use any iPhone or any Android phone to connect to our system, before you can do so, you must have an account on our cloud, right? You gotta have a cloud account or you never get the keys to the system. And so the security for the lighting control system is managed through the cloud, even though it's executed locally. So we think this is a really good balance of, of use of the cloud is to use the cloud to validate user access and then allow the system to operate locally uh, so that you're not, not dependent on the cloud for your lighting control. And then finally, mutual device authentication just means that, that everything in the system has to have the right keys. Um, you know, my iPhone has to have the right keys. Any other radio talking to another radio has to have the right keys in order to, to communicate. So, 
the beautiful thing about Enlight, and Enlight Air is no different, is that it can operate as what we call a standalone or a locally networked system. So I don't need any fancy uh, high-end PLC or central brain in order for Enlight to function and Enlight Air to function. So I can have a wall control down here or some sort of external trigger that can send a wireless signal to my group monitor. And actually, it sends it out to the whole group. Uh, the group monitor basically just repeats it and says, hey, I have a better vantage point than this wall switch. And so it basically repeats it, sends it out to the whole group. And so the whole group basically acts together. This is to prevent any kind of popcorn, right? When you're out there, when you're out there with, uh, with a, uh, you know, trying to get a bunch of fixtures to work together, you want them to work in select groups, right? You don't control fixtures typically individually. You might group them in different ways, shapes, or form. That's the power of having individual fixture control. But once they're grouped, you want to control them as a group. Hey, this is the fab. This is fab one. This is fab two. You know, we want to be able to just control them in groups in intelligent manners. And we can do that without any uh, extra hardware, just the fixtures and some wall controls or the fixtures themselves. If I just want them to, to work together with occupancy, I just group, you know, 10 fixtures together over the, the tool cage. And those 10 fixtures are now an occupancy sensor, occupancy zone. They'll go up and down together and on and off together if that's my desired sequence. Went backwards for a second. All right. So it makes your startup very simple. You can start the whole system up uh, with an iPhone. And if you want to scale up later on, you absolutely can. So you keep that system in place. And then you can start networking. You can building block. Now this, this example here shows troughers, but these could just as easily be, I didn't have time to swap out these troughers for uh, high bays, but this could easily be high bay lighting. It could be uh, almost uh, outdoor lighting. It could be any real lighting that can have an embedded control in it. Once you group them together, then it has a centralized system, which is our Eclipse controller. That Eclipse controller is an automation controller. And that automation controller basically um, we actually haven't updated this slide. Uh, we used to poll. We also now have an event-driven architecture that basically just tells the Eclipse when, the, when devices change state. So um, it doesn't necessarily poll all the time. And there is priority communication. If certain events happen, it can actually trigger an event that doesn't have to wait for the polling. Uh, so uh, it's basically a secure communication from the uh, group monitors or actually from the individual fixtures back to the central hub, the Eclipse controller. So the group monitor still monitors local communication, still used for local responses. What we do here is by adding in this Eclipse controller, now we can add in time-based system-wide control. If you wanna change the way your system operates at a certain given time, if you need to do demand response, if you gotta have automated demand response like in the state of California, um, that's where your ADDR uh, uh, gateway resides, is in the automation controller, right? And then you can also have hybrid wired and wireless systems. So you, can, you don't necessarily have to make the whole thing wireless. If you have applications that have drop ceilings, drop ceilings are made to hide wires. In a lot of cases, the control wires, it's a lot cheaper and easier just to do wired systems where wired systems make sense. All right, and, but the one big thing is you still have one software interface. Okay, so the integration possibilities are, are pretty vast. I'm just gonna click through all of these. So essentially the, the platform, the Eclipse platform, uh, at its core, at its core, what it sees itself as is a BACnet platform, right? It is internally, it is BACnet, um, and externally, it's also BACnet by default, right? By default, it, it produces BACnet points for every lighting group, every lighting fixture, if you want it. And I'm gonna caution most people here, if, you're, if, you're, if your design guidance is, I wanna control every single fixture, uh, you should probably rethink that guidance because in most cases, you really don't want to control individual fixtures. Control is usually best done after you group the fixtures. Now you might wanna change those groupings and that's why you have individual control of every fixture. But the important part here is, is that I wanna have some method to group my fixtures together. And then I wanna have some method to monitor and control that group. And that's pretty much the basics of lighting control uh, and why you would want to do uh, a different strategy. Now, 
um, adding in an industrial environment because most industrial systems don't speak BACnet. Um, the, the, the obviously what was needed is protocol conversion. So we came up with the, uh, the common industrial protocol gateway, uh, which basically takes BACnet IP. This uh, slide, the, the blue arrow is a little bit wrong. It should actually be connected to the, the LAN just like all the rest of them are. It is an ethernet device, ethernet to ethernet device. And uh, it takes, basically takes BACnet IP and converts it in a two-way manner back and forth between uh, the common industrial protocol, which is the uh, ether IP version of the common industrial protocol. Um, and we're not making a secret of it. You can see the field server label on there. Um, it is actually a field server product that we are OEMing and setting up and warranting as part of our system. All right. Any questions? I, actually, I'm going to pause right there. Tim, are there any questions on that? I want to make sure that point is clear. That, that no, no questions yet. Okay. Yeah. The, the common area here is that you know even if this this uh, the gateway goes down, um, you know, like I said, lighting control continues. If you have you know any override switches, you have time-based protocols and the rest of that. Um, it, it happens and stays on the lighting control side. But if you want to have, let's say you have want to have an HMI, you want to have a you want to take and have a screen on your PLC uh, human machine interface that, that basically allows me to control lighting. An operator can control the lighting over a process. So you absolutely could, could set this up so that it would communicate directly to uh, whatever you know, uh, software they were running as an automation platform and be able to pull it up, pull lighting up as just another point in your process. So that is the value. Um, basically, I think I already summed up the value where you can basically pull it into your UI on the industrial side and not have to have a separate system for, uh, for lighting instead of having all of your systems for automation. Um, and there's some different responses. I mean, you wanna, you wanna blink your lights uh, in case of an emergency. That's one strategy you can do. Um, we have one customer that basically blinks the lights every shift change They use the, the lighting system. They don't necessarily blink them. They just dim them down and dim them right back up in sections. You want to be very careful doing anything like that, using your lighting, obviously, as a signaling method, particularly where people are, you know, working around automated processes. Safety is always uh, paramount. And so a lot of times what they use that for is actually monitoring and making sure that the lights are on uh, when they need to be on. Uh, or they're flagging it as a safety requirement. Or sometimes they're just documenting that, hey, the lights were on or the lights were at 100% or the lights were pulling this kind of energy, um, that sort of thing. You don't wanna make this too overly complex. I, this is one of those areas where I do think the KISS principle applies. Uh, simple and straightforward is, has great value, I think, uh, when we start talking about industrial environments. So what's possible? Uh, you can control anything basically through there. You can control down to the fixture level uh, if you really want to. Uh, don't recommend that. Usually recommend that you that you control at the group level. Um, and because we typically lean and leverage towards sensor-based uh, control, where we where the sensors basically uh, know that somebody's below them, then we usually don't even you know do control anymore. We do profiles. We monitor. And we change configuration of the status. You know, so for instance, if you know that the factory floor is closed for a 10-hour period at night, you can change and turn sensor value or sensor detection way down and sensor timeouts way down, so that you save energy without actually shutting the lights off on people uh, accidentally. So you, the nice thing about this is you don't have to have or this strategy is that you don't have to really spend a lot of time worrying about schedules. Um, a lot of industrial time is 24-7. You know, if you're a 24-7 operation, you know, your need for lighting control is, is pretty minor. Um, you, know, you don't need a ton of lighting control for 24-7 operations. Uh, if you're in the state of California, you probably have to have uh, demand reduction. And you know, so you want to have something that can do you know, dim 10% or 20% off the top of your lighting you know, during those periods of time. But you don't want to have really super complex uh, control scenarios in most industrial environments. But obviously, if, if the areas are not being used, you want to turn the lights down. Uh, fantastic. If you know you can turn the lights off, then you know, certainly turn the lights off. Um, just do so in a safe manner. That's all, the, that's all that matters.
okay? Uh, and this the only thing this slide's trying to tell you is do it in groups, right? Do it in groups. Don't do it in individual fixtures. Recommend you do it in groups or do it plant-wide. All right, so each of the, the, the CIP gateways uh, support 250 or 500 points. Uh, you, this is another thing that it offers is point reduction. If, if you decide, hey, we're only gonna control stuff in groups, then it definitely reduces the number of points that you uh, need to manage, right? If you're both an integrator or a customer, you know, once you have your group set, you don't really want to manage individual fixtures. And so the important part here is to say, okay, I got a, I got a thousand fixtures on my manufacturing floor and I'm gonna divide those up into a hundred groups which is pretty typical, um, you know, you can get a hundred, a 10 to one, basically point reduction capability by saying, by, you know, saying, hey, look, we're just gonna control and monitor everything in groups. Uh, and the problem or the benefit and problem with lighting is that we have so many devices. We have a lot more devices than say HVAC does where, you know, on a huge manufacturing floor, I might have, you know, if it is air conditioned at all, I might have 10, you know, 10 air conditioned units you know, for several thousand square feet uh, or a hundred thousand square feet, where for lighting, I might have a thousand devices, right? So it's, it's, it's one thing, point reduction and lighting control is a big deal. How many points do you really want to manage? How many points do you really want to control? So uh, from the integrator standpoint, uh, it's your job to basically create the, the mapping and say, look, we want to have, you know, a hundred different areas. And so we'll create a hundred hooks between the inlight side and the industrial equipment. And at that point, basically it becomes a seamless transition from back net over to, to uh, SIP and, and back and forth. So once you map those through the gateway, those points are, are basically hooked and they are writable. If they're writable on the, uh, on the back net side, they're writable and commandable on the uh, SIP side. So here's an example. Uh, you basically have some inlight air controllable fixtures. You might have an inlight air uh, wall control somewhere. Um, this could also be uh, some sort of push button contact closure if you want to do those sort of things. Uh, and then those fixtures talk to the uh, our gateway, and then that gateway talks to excuse me our controller, and then our controller talks to the gateway, and then it goes off to the infrastructure via Ethernet. Um, and by the way, the, 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 the CIP W, excuse me, the gateway and the controller can be in the same enclosure, right? They have room in that enclosure and power in that enclosure. So we just basically add that. So even though we're showing two discrete components here, um, on the wall, you're going to have one box. So here's just a comparison, quick comparison between how we do things on the acuity architecture side of things and how some other folks out there that um, do it with a centralized architecture, you know, how they operate. And basically the controller becomes the central point of control, which has its advantages, but it's also its major disadvantages that becomes critical. It becomes a critical piece of infrastructure. And you do not want, <clears throat> for instance, your lights to be reliant on a server in the back of house or someplace or communication to that server in order to be controllable. Because if the lights are turned off and then the system were to fail, then how do you get your lights back on, right? And so you want to make sure that, at least to our mind, our value proposition is, is our experience tells us that that's a bad scenario. It's a high risk scenario, low reward. And so um, our architecture leverages that distributed power of control. Uh, even if you were to lose the, the industrial gateway and all of the controllers, all you would lose would be time-based control and central management. You still have light control. You still have occupancy sensors doing what they do. Um, if you had wall controls, they would still continue to function locally in whatever manner they were um, they were left in. Uh, we also have, I shouldn't, it's not in this presentation, but we should also mention we have egress fixtures. So if you have egress requirements that are built into your lighting control system, those are also maintained even without the presence of any kind of controller. Uh, so if you do have to have egress requirements where when you go on generator, you have to force certain lights on, then those lights will stay on uh, and are all done down at the local level. Nothing in the egress world requires or should require the use of a centralized controller. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Any questions on that? Hearing none, I'll continue on. Um, but stop me if you guys have any questions. Uh, this is obviously a better presentation if you guys can throw in your interjections here. Um, the uh, the biggest, I think most people think that energy savings is pretty much table stakes uh, for a lighting control system. You can only save so much energy with standalone lighting control. Um, if you have a centralized lighting control and you have better awareness of when your system is in operation, you can force uh, certain lights down or force certain lights off, which greatly enhance your energy savings. Uh, energy savings can come in some areas that you don't normally think about it, like your parking lot. Uh, people don't realize how much wasted light there are in parking structures, parking lots, uh, areas, holding areas, warehouses, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so by adding in network capability, you double down basically on your energy savings. Uh, and so the real question becomes, you know, can I do it? Can I do network lighting control in an affordable manner so that my payback is justified, right? Because network lighting controls are more expensive than standalone lighting controls and they have to pay for themselves, right? They have to generate some revenue in order to pay for themselves. So they can't be incredibly expensive. Uh, and so one of the things that the DLC system, by the way, that's digital light uh, uh, Design Lights Consortium is the, uh, the vetting process that talks about, you know, what a system needs to do in order to be uh, listed with the uh, DLC, DLC listed. So, all right. So I already talked about this, but I'm going to hit it again just so people understand why we talk about putting the control in the system. So when you put the control in the fixture itself, you basically get rid of, and especially if it's a wireless control, uh, you eliminate that the cost of AC to DC conversion for the control system. It's already done in many cases by the driver. Um, a lot of our controls these days are being powered up off of the aux power off the driver, or they're being powered up off of a line voltage connection inside the fixture. And so the contractor ever installs it only has one termination to make. They put power to the fixture, and they basically walk away at that point. Um, all the surge protection, all of the other stuff that you have to have is all internal to the fixture, tested at the factory. Uh, all of our stuff is guaranteed to interoperate. So when you have a fixture and a control, probably one of the greatest interface issues is between the driver and the control itself. Uh, I will say or share that there is actually some pretty good uh, recent development in that arena. But right now, the state of the industry is that the drivers are controlled via either zero to 10 volt for the most part, which is a, a non-standard. There is no uh, international standard for zero to 10 volt fixture control. Uh, there's, there's a convention, there's an industry convention and how to do it, uh, but uh, there is no standard for that. Uh, so as there are also digital protocols that are starting to be used, uh, but the digital protocols typically are more expensive. Uh, so if you can use a zero to 10 volt internal communication for your dimming and on and off control and have maybe uh, the ability to tell what's going on with the fixture, then you, uh, and you can do that at a very low price point, a very attractive price point, then you meet that bar and you can, you have a return on investment and you have a story to tell. Um, so digital protocols are coming. And we are keeping and keeping kind of keeping in track of it. And we're probably going to, to convert, we're actually converting several of our fixtures over to digital control, but the market isn't really there yet. Um, the, the cost uh, hasn't come down enough and the, the savings is not really there that we can see that can justify digital controls yet. But it probably will happen. It will probably happen sometime in the next five years. Fewer devices to install, yes. All right, so again, we start as a standalone system. You just basically have an app-based system with motion sensors. This is a drop ceiling environment uh, example again, but the same can be true for, for a industrial area. I can basically hang 20 fixtures in a space with occupancy sensors and photo cells, and I can do motion sensing, high-low motion sensing, daylight harvesting without any other controls. I don't really need anything else. 
walls. They don't even need a wall control, really. The wall control in the industrial space uh, just may not be there. And then I can build out my space where I start to automate the stuff together, start to connect it all together, and now I add in time-based control. All right. Plus, I have one other future thing. This is where we can start talking about IoT. Uh, IoT use cases are, you know, they're floating around everywhere. Um, there's a lot more hype, I can tell you, with IoT right now than there is reality, but there is some very strong applications and use cases that are being built and being delivered. So, um, and we're right in the middle of that with our Atrius offering, which basically says, hey, we've already got a Bluetooth radio in these fixtures. How about we leverage that Bluetooth radio uh, for, because each one of these Bluetooth radios can also be a Bluetooth beacon um, and can play a role in your IoT transformation as well. So I'm gonna click real quickly through this slide here just to expose everything. Uh, basically, the inlight air system, because there are components that can go in both the industrial space, uh, in our industrial fixtures, they can go in our outdoor fixtures, they can go pretty much anywhere they can play uh, into this, this area. And with that, that is the end. We actually finished a little bit early because we didn't have any questions. Um, I show 12.38 on, the, on my time. Uh, which should be uh, what 1038, I guess, out on the West Coast. Are there any questions? I have a question, Kyle. Yeah. This is Virgil Thompson. Um, the demand response capability of the Inlight Eclipse um, mm -hmm. used to be handled through a, um, it was like an ADR uh, piece yep. of hardware. Has that now been embedded into the Eclipse and that, that hardware? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is it's, it's, it's part of an application in the Eclipse itself. And my follow-up question would be for the uh, digital drivers, what are the advantages of using a digital driver uh, for a fixture solution versus the zero to 10 volt? So there's a couple, um, it's not just, so let's, let's talk about digital first. Let me address digital first. Having a digital driver means that I get bi-directional communication from my control system to my, um, to my driver, right? Which means that the driver can just tell me what its load is, right? So most, most drivers have some awareness of, of the voltage and the load that they, are, that they are working on. So a smart driver can basically say, hey, I'm, my input voltage is you know, 268 volts. I'm producing you know, 800 milliamps of current and I've done so for 10,467 hours, right? And so from a monitoring standpoint, a digital driver could offer that information up. And what does that eliminate? That eliminates the need for any kind of external uh, current monitor, temp uh, voltage and current monitor. A lot of your lighting control systems include an external current monitor uh, for, for doing that. We actually don't in our inlight systems because we found that, that very few customers actually um, are want, willing to look at the data, right? And so if there's, you know, nobody looking at the data, then, you know, why, why collect it, right? Why collect data and nobody's looking at it? And then the other side of it is, um, along with the digital standard comes powering standards. So for instance, I'll bring up one standard that we are examining right now is the D4i. Dolly, uh, Dolly the international Dolly standard out there has a standard called D4i and D4i basically allows a driver manufacturer to create a standardized driver that communicates and puts out power in a standardized manner. And then that way I can build a control, a separate third party could build a control that would be also be compliant with that standard and tested to that standard. And so you could marry those two up in a fixture um, that would give you the same idea. Because right now the biggest problem is just, you know, what I said about it, earlier that holds true is, is how do I put a control from brand X in a fixture made by brand Z when there's no standards that dictate how that control is gonna get powered and how that control is going to communicate back into the driver, into the functioning part of that system. So the D4i spec, um, which is pretty new, um, there's not very much support for it here in the United States. Dolly is, a, is not very strong uh, here in the United States as a lighting control protocol. Uh, it's more of an overseas requirement in Europe and in Asia. Uh, and so, but we are aware of it and we're, you know, we keep a close eye on it. 
because we do understand the value of it. Um, internally, for a lot of our fixtures, we're starting to go digital. But I can tell you that in the industrial side of things, uh, we are, we're not able to, most of the industrial drivers that are out there are not smart drivers. They're just zero 10 volt dimming drivers. And so there's an upgrade cost to go to a digital driver that a lot of people aren't necessarily willing to spring for yet. So did that answer the question? Yeah, thank you very much. That was great, thank you. Any other questions? Nothing on our end here. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So Tim, yeah. did, uh, were there any questions in the chat? I, I don't have the chat up. I saw somebody. Uh, no, nothing so far. Okay. Um, Good. Okay. Right, so the, uh, I think we answered the warranty question and the driver question. Those were both great questions. I appreciate you guys for that. And uh, I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up then. Okay. Let me just wrap it up real quick here. Yeah, so just a just a quick reminder that uh, you know you can all, you can also contact your Buffalo Smith representative to discuss uh, the right lighting solutions for your market and industry applications, and you can submit those questions to webinar at buckles-smith.com. And uh, just to wrap it up, you know I want to thank you all for joining us today. Also, a huge thanks, of course, to Kyle and everyone at Hall of Fame for partnering with us on this webinar and making it happen. Uh, you know, we hope you found it both informative and enjoyable. And thank you. So. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, have a happy holiday. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Thank Kyle. You. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Tim.